tell you all this uh, examination the uh, the, uh, the uh, dissertation of Nick Corinne, Master of Science, is examined for the degree of uh, uh, Doctor of Technology, Doctor of Science. And um, uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Alessandro Magara from uh, uh, Politecnico di Milano as an opponent. And uh, my, I myself am um, kind of uh, commissioned by the, uh, by the School of Science to, to be as a custos, cust custos for this occasion. And uh, on this website, we have the, the uh, examination open. Honored Pustos, honored opponent, ladies and gentlemen. The availability of network sensors is increasing rapidly. I believe that everybody in this room is carrying a network sensing equipment. Fast stream processing of large quantities of data is becoming a critical competitive advantage. There are plenty of application areas where that is being used. So we need highly distributed, multi coupled solutions based on common standards. And here, uh, proprietary platforms would be challenge to do the job. The semantic web standards RDF, Sparkle, and all offer a good base for interoperability, but how would they work for event processing? Now I will walk you through some key concepts to understand the rest of the discussion. What I mean by an event is anything <coughs> that happens or that can be contemplated as happening. An event object then is a record of these observations in a system environment such as a computer. So what arises, there is a flood, it can be measured by measurement equipment, observed, <coughs> we can obtain information from other data sources, and we can create an object in a computer which is telling us something about this real world and happening. Then in a domain called complex event processing, different categories for event objects have been defined. The basic element is a simple event that is, for instance, coming from a single sensor. Then we can <coughs> bound those together in a composite event in which all of these simple events still exist within that body and can be separated. And then you can refine it further into a complex event which gives information of a higher level, higher layer, but may not have all the simple uh, models of, of events anymore built in. And you can see here that, that, for instance, if you have very complex sensing equipment, it has a hundred parameters, and this kind of simple event can appear very complex. Whereas a complex event, which for instance tells that the house is on fire or a credit card has been stolen, looks very simple on the outskirts but it may have hundreds of data coming in, so don't let the books deceive you. So for events, both time point and interval semantics are used in the literature. In my study, I have restricted to time point observations. And one of the reasons for this is that if you, for instance, consider this occasion, this, this public defense, is, is this an event? popular interpretation of the English language, it, it would be the case. For me, not really. Because if this was our event, and we would have the starting time and the ending time, we could only stream this object after the event has been finished. And then we would be late for any operation that might be related to what is happening here now. So that is why, for me, this is a state that started when Honor Pustos declared the defense open, and it will be terminated sometime in the future when the defense is closed. 
and I can stream both of these opening and closing events, and then it impacts, for instance, how reluctant a lot the door would be to let people in to this room when, when we are in session. Then, in addition to those two concepts, there are also things which do not have an associated time validity, and they are called background knowledge. So here is an example from my first publication. If in the background we know that friend of is a symmetric property, and Jim is a friend of Alan, and that implies that Alan is also a friend of Jim, might not always be true, but for this example it is. And now we have an example where both of these persons are reporting their locations, and once we find that they are close to each other, we can uh, issue nearby notifications. And this leads to a state in the system where we find out that Jim is close to Alan, and this state persists until we find out that they have moved further away from each other that terminates the state. So location updates here are simple events, and these nearby notifications, they are derived information, so complex events. Then what is stream processing? In traditional database processing, first have some data, it goes into a database, the customer, be it a computer or a person, makes a query and gets a response. And the response is complete related to the data that, that was in the database. In stream processing, there is first some data flowing. The data can flow infinitely from, from our point of view. At some point, we register a query, which is trying to find some information from that data. And some answers will hopefully be found, some responses that match our query. But we will never know whether there was some data that flowed before we registered our query, or whether some more data will come later on. So we cannot call this solution complete in that sense. Then in stream processing, some of the main disciplines have been known as data stream processing, event processing from a historical viewpoint. Uh, in data stream processing, the uh, first operation has been to cut a time window out of the industry. So you take a limited amount of time, run a query over that, and that gives you some response then later on. In event processing systems, you start from the events themselves and run a query on those and typically look at patterns of events <coughs> running in that system. And you can quite soon also see from here that, that this window, the time window of data stream processing is a special case of the event processing. So typically an event processing system will have a windowing operator that can do this windowing. But if you cut time windows out of your stream as the first operation, then you can no longer get back to your complete stream. Complex event processing. In the event processing glossary, it's called computing that performs operation on complex events. That's not a very useful definition for us. But then what it really means here is that these simple lower layer events are abstracted into more tangible higher layer events in a system where we have event processing agents processing events in succession and, and trying to find higher layer information out of them. With a venue half full of people concentrating on semantic web, I should quickly say what's semantic web, but this is now my intro on the subject. So the web, as most people know it, is sometimes referred to as the web of documents. We access documents by browsers, they link to other documents. In the semantic web, sometimes referred to as the web of data, we also use URI. But there we also have uh, standardized or specified ontologies which explain the linkage and the meaning, semantic meaning, behind our URIs. So as an example, in the web, you search for Nokia, you may get Nokia the company or Nokia the town, and we as people have a lot of context by which we can understand the difference between these two things. For a computer, it's much more difficult. But if we start from a URI whose label is, is Nokia and the semantic web, it can typically link to a concept which then is related to electronics company. So now we know which Nokia we have. And if we find another URI for Nokia, we may have a same as relation defining that these two URIs are indeed referring to the same node. In the semantic web data is represented as RDF. 
three books, basically. You see a graphical representation <coughs> of subject, um, predicate, object in the figure, and a turtle serialization above, which, which has these same elements for data. It's queried with the Sparky query language. And here you see a query, which is basically matching these triple patterns. This is uh, this query is looking for concepts which are of type that is a subclass of something else and, and then lists those. Now I've also used extensively SparkQL update, which was developed as an as a maintenance language originally for RDF triple stores. So if we replace the select with an insert, now we can feed back some uh, data into our system. And what did this mean? Actually, the rule that you see here is known in, as RDFS9 in the RDFS entailment, or catch go in the old to RL. So if we have a definition that rabbit is a subclass of animal, and then we have this furry guy here, let's, let's call him Elmer, and we get a triple saying that Elmer is a rabbit, then this rule will insert the information that Elmer is also an animal. And after that, our system can do or give any information that we know is related to animals and know that it relates to Elmer, even if we never explicitly told the system that fact. So now in one slide, I've shown to you what is part of query, part of update, and rule-based reasoning. OK, now we look at some of the contributions in the publications, which are in my thesis. And first, to, to understand what was going on, I wanted to show you how we positioned ourselves. So Instance was the platform we were working on, event processing using the semantic web. And basically, if you make this kind of um, graph, then, then all of these other squares are highly populated by, by lots and lots of systems. But then we found ourselves pretty alone in, in our corner there. So for the first publication, I compared with data stream processing. Second one didn't have any performance comparisons. That's a workshop paper. For the third one, we or I insisted on doing something which only instance can do. And it was really difficult to publish it because there was no perfect comparison with anything else. So I have to get repeating that there is no other system that can do this. So I, I cannot do that kind of a comparison. Fourth one, we went outside our comfort zone of the semantic web and compared with a usual event processing system. And then for the fifth publication, we took uh, static triple stores and an example which could be run on those. So in a sense, we had to be walking this, this line outside our real comfort zone most of the time. The first publication in the thesis was really kind of a proof of concept. And most of the things which, which reappeared then in later publications were already used there. So collaboration of specification compliance, Sparkle query, and update rules to do event processing. And in this first public publication, the example was the friends nearby, which I demonstrated. So persons sending location events and then finding out if the two people are close to each other. This was realized with uh, a network of four concurrently operating Spark UL queries and rules in that case. Then the second publication was adding these concepts of complex event processing to RDF um, through a, a new vocabulary. So we defined complex and composite event events, definitions to separate header and payload elem elements in, in an event object. And then we also showed how to copy and, and uh, move, delete that kind of complex and, and composite events. And then also added some timestamps for an event object to, to be able to separate the signal at the time that the event was sampled, time it entered the data stream, and the arrival in the event processing system. And then finally, also some expiration. 
for the third publication, I then wanted to try to validate this approach for complex event processing and, and uh, show that with the tools we have, we can really do appropriately the thing that, that is known as complex event processing. So I took examples of all the types of event processing agents found in related literature and also used for the first time named RDF graphs as, as event channels in this paper. Here is an example of a query network. In this one, we had five different queries counting the number of events per hour. So first we initialize our memory with something. We extract all the hour from the incoming events. We have one query to increase the event counter if the new hour uh, is equal to the one we had in memory. And once the next hour comes, we output the count that we have at the moment and, and reset the memory. So there is an example of a small query network doing this. In this paper, uh, I also demoed for the first time using a remote Spark UL endpoint for enriching events. It was a fairly straightforward thing for my colleague to implement and fairly straightforward thing for me to do. These three lines of code are picking up the name of a location for, for my events. So for instance, Lauplazari or, or Espo into an external service. And if you think of what what difference does this make, then it, it actually makes all the difference in the world because that means that I can pull information into my events from the linked open data cloud, which on last year's count was about 150 billion. And then, in addition to that, any SparkQL endpoint, which I can set up myself, I can also use. Of course, this also slows down the processing uh, quite a lot. So we went down from about 500 events per, per second into about three events per second because of accessing an external service. But if you need that information, then that should be an acceptable trade-off. We also run into trouble at that point with Turtle because our events were splitting into pieces in, in certain cases. And there was a new specification called Trig, which allowed us to send a graph instead of succession of, of RDF triples. And this allowed us to keep our <coughs> events in one piece. So from the third paper onwards, we use Trig form for our events. Then also to show platform maturity, I did a test of combining them, all of these eight different kinds of, of event processing agents together <coughs> and, and running some tests on, on that and, and could show that, that our platform can run also this kind of a system, which is fairly complex already for them. Could, a corresponding system could be used for a lot of different purposes. The fourth paper was a performance comparison with a practical example counterfeit and theft detection in pharmaceutical manufacturing. And now we really had to change the framework. So basically code the same application twice because there was no other semantic web-based system that could carry this out. So we converted our RDF events to XML for a system called SPEF. And then we had our own queries in SparkUL. We wrote another, or I wrote another application for SPEF in EPL, and I want to shortly also go into this task because it shows some interesting differences between these different platforms. So the thing that we are doing here is we get products. All of them are identified with an electronic product code. They are scanned during commissioning and packing operations, packed on various levels. If a commissioned EPC is not found in packing, it should be reported stolen. And if a non-commissioned EPC is found in packing, it should be reported as counterfeit because someone has inserted it on the production line in between places. And there you see graphs of or flowcharts of, of implementation for instance on the left and Esper on the right. On instance, I can take the EPCs from each of these data flows and, and store them temporarily. 
and then see that if the commissioning and packing EPCs are equal or if equal EPCs are found, then I just remove them, everything is fine. This EPC went through both phases. Then I can have other queries checking that, that do we have a commissioning EPC sliding out of the window without a packing EPC coming to, to uh, or corresponding to packing EPC coming. And if that happens, we need to report the product lost in, in between those two phases. In Esper, we cannot write this kind of a query because Esper is not the continuously processing rule system. It needs an event from somewhere to, to react into things. But Esper defines this kind of um, object specific <coughs> windows, and we insert commissioning and packing EPCs now into windows, and then we see that, that if we have a match between those two windows, we insert such an EPC into a matching window and delete it from the window. Now Esper cannot separate <coughs> why something is appearing in this remote tree, whether it timed out from the window or whether it was explicitly deleted. So we have to check once more that <coughs> the EPC that we saw in the remote stream was not in the matching window then we know that it appeared here because it timed out and we need to report it lost. So that was very quick, but nevertheless, two very different algorithms to realize the same thing. And we verified that these two give exactly the same result anyway. And these are then the ways that, that these tests had to be carried out. I also verified with the CPO expert tech that, that this is also from their point of view the best solution for this on expert. The instant has its own challenges that if you have a lot of EPCs in the buffer, this condition gets checked every time time moves forward and, and instant slows down a lot in that case. <coughs> That's also discussed in, in the tape. Then we also had some qualitative comparison comparing the uh, using semantic web based technologies over uh, not applying to those. Maybe we will push a bit forward on, on that. And then in the fifth paper, we had support for reasoning as the, the topic. So you remember the rule about Elmer, reasoning is creating new knowledge out of facts and rules. So I checked all the entailment regimes for uh, RDF and implemented them over instance altogether 100 unique rules, 21 unsatisfied ability conditions. This chart here is basically showing how much is common. The numbers are the number of rules in each uh, entailment regime. And this shows that what kind of overlaps there are. This system allows complete customization of rules because they are also sparkier, and that's good. One way to argue why that's a good thing is that the current compliance test set only covered, for instance, 17% of all two uh, RL. So you really don't need the complete set to, for instance, be compliant with, with this system. And also, the benchmark I used was the Viha University benchmark. It actually only requires a total of eight rules to pass all 14 queries. And no query there requires more than three rules. So again, um, no, no reason to have 58 rules unless you need them for, for some other purpose. Then in various different papers, I was touching event-based memory handling to keep the memory clean. And that was most developed in, in this fifth publication where the system I used was such that first we have this background information flowing in, going into its own uh, named graph. After that, when events come in, we process the result. And after each event, we can remove everything in, in the main graph. And this way, keep the memory clean, run much, much longer streams than, than would be otherwise possible. OK, so now shortly to, to summarize what I have learned in, in these studies. Most of these <coughs> concepts were already 
mentioned, but so I developed RDF definitions for composite and complex events, headers and payloads, timestamps. The most important part is the complex event processing using networks of asynchronously operating specification compliance RPL update rules. And I have demonstrated those cases also here. So in total, I can say that event processing using RDF and SparkGL has been tested with structured heterogeneous events, asynchronously operating networks of SparkGL queries and update rules, different types of event processing agents presented in literature. All of this has been verified using an executable platform, and all of the code queries, data, and documentation are openly available for independent verification. The performance of the instance platform has been tested in various applications. A couple of examples there. So the first publication, we found the average notification delay to be 12 milliseconds. It developed a lot more after that. But it's anyway considerably faster than you would want to repeat a window on a typical data stream processing system, because that means that you also repeat the query all the time when, when you run that. For the medical uh, or pharmaceutical manufacturing example, there was a real-life target of 2.83 EPC per second, which was found out by, by interviewing people in the industry. That was exceeded 950 times. <coughs> on the so for that application, it, it would work fine. Then we showed average speeds up to 1,810 events per second, or a bit over 21,000 triples per second on, on various <coughs> Based on this, I can make some performance improvement suggestions for instance, as well as identify a number of spark load enhancements for event processing. I can identify some challenges of the approach. The main thing is that it can be somewhat complex in, in some cases. So implementation efficiency is the challenge, and that's a challenge that you would wish to meet if, if you want to use some of the unique properties present in, in this system. Finally, some conclusions on one slide. So I think I can say that RDF and Spark will offer a flexible framework for layered processing of structured heterogeneous events. This is best suited for distributed, loosely coupled environments. I have measured the performance for a variety of cases in a test platform, and it would be sufficient for many real-world stream processing tasks. 